Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for showing up. So, invasive plants of Missouri's bottomlands, stream banks, riparian areas in general. Uh, invasive species control is something that I've had a couple years of, I guess, both professional and personal experience with. Uh, so, if there's one talk I'm qualified to give, I guess it would be this one. Uh, kind of going to break this into a couple parts. First, I just kind of want to give a background in general of invasive plants and invasive plants in North America and in Missouri, kind of what they are, why they are what they are, how they got here, things like that. Uh, so first, uh, when people generally hear of invasive species, uh, what usually comes to mind is different animals. They're the ones that get all the media and the press, things like the invasive uh, Burmese pythons and the Everglades feral pigs, Asian carp in the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, nutria, emerald ash borers, things like that. And they are bad, but there are actually way more species of invasive plants in most places, and they are just as bad, if not worse, for the ecosystem in many ways. Uh, but they don't get as much attention because they're plants. Uh, so to kind of uh, differentiate some terms, uh, Know, exotic species versus invasive species. Uh, by most definitions, all invasive species are exotic. They are coming from another place. They have been in artificially introduced to a new habitat that they are not native to. They have no evolutionary history there. They're not indigenous. But not all exotic species are necessarily invasive. So there are plenty of plants and animals that have been introduced around the world. Uh, they don't explode in numbers and take over the ecosystem and have a negative impact. They're just kind of there. They don't do a whole lot. Whereas invasive species, by definition, are causing ecological harm to the areas where they've been introduced. Now, there are some caveats there that sometimes it can take time for an exotic species to then kind of become or show itself as invasive as it's building up populations or adapting to the new environment. And one species, when introduced to one area, might not become invasive, but when introduced to another area with a different kind of habitat, it can just explode and take over. Uh, that's especially true with, with island habitats. So many things become invasive when they're introduced to islands just because they're so uh, isolated. So invasive species in general, it's a global problem. It's not just Missouri, it's not just America. They're everywhere now. They're on every country. Uh, in the United States, they cost hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of economic and environmental damage. Uh, you see, this is a port in Africa that's been infested with water hyacinth from South America. Obviously, you can see that probably makes navigating in that, that harbor difficult. Uh, and they're the major causes of uh, decline for many different native species around the world, especially endangered and threatened species. Uh, Plants included, also animals. Uh, so invasive plants specifically, uh, only a small fraction of exotic plant species ever show themselves as invasive, it's probably less than 10%. Uh, but given the fact that there are several thousand, several thousands of exotic species in this country, many hundreds of them are invasive. It's a lot of invasive species. Uh, we have a couple hundred in Missouri alone. Uh, and often, uh, they're kind of harder to get rid of than animals in the environment. Uh, obviously, they're living at a much higher density. Within an acre, you might have hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals. Uh, you know, and if you leave a couple seeds in the soil or a couple of root fragments, it might completely regenerate. Uh, with animals, it's, that's not the case. They're usually easier to get rid of. So, as far as things that all invasive plants have in common, uh, a lot of them are what you call ruderal species or early successional species. Uh, they're species that are often characterized by a couple different traits. So one of them is they produce a lot of offspring, kind of like mice. They're really, really good at making babies. So invasive plants, they often make a lot of seeds. Uh, a lot of, most of those seeds are viable, so they have a high germination rate. Uh, they often grow very, very rapidly. Uh, part of that because they can invest all of their energy and growth as opposed to defending themselves. We'll kind of get into that later. Uh, they usually have pretty effective means of dispersing 
and colonizing new habitats. They're usually pretty adaptable species, so they're not specialists. They don't just like one really particular kind of habitat. They can kind of grow in a varying a variation of different uh, environments. Uh, another thing about them is many of them are allelopathic. They exhibit allelopathy, which means that they, through usually some chemical means, they actually inhibit the growth or germination of the plants around them. We have native plants that do that, like black walnut and sunflowers, but uh, you know, they, other plants that are native generally have some history, evolutionarily speaking, to uh, adapt and kind of counteract that. Whereas with the invasive species, the native plants uh, are kind of naive. Uh, they often exceed in disturbed habitats uh, and being like uh, early successional species. They like things uh, being open and sunny. Uh, if there's been a lot of wildfires or flooding or movement of soil, heavy grazing, things like that, they tend to exceed in those kinds of places. Uh, and of course, they outcompete native plants. That's why they're invasive. Uh, and here is a picture of kudzu. Kudzu. That's uh, an Asian vine. It's invasive in the south. You can see in this picture. Uh, this is what it can do. It's called the vine that ate the south and you know, kind of lives up to its name. That's all kudzu in that picture. So as far as how invasive plants got here, uh, it really depends on the species. There's been a couple different, different avenues as to how they're getting here. Uh, some of them have been here for centuries. They, they came over with the first European colonists. Uh, some of those were accidentals. So things like hay, people uh, brought hay from Europe over to the Americas to feed their livestock when they first brought them over. That hay contained seeds from European plants. That's things like teasels and thistles. So there were some accidental ones. Uh, some were intentionally brought over by early colonists uh, for kind of herbs or edible garden plants. There are some ornamentals, uh, some are for livestock forage. Uh, the U.S. government actually played a pretty significant role in introducing a lot of uh, different species kind of between the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. Uh, in fact, there was actually a kind of section of the U.S. Department of Agriculture called the Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction. Uh, and most of that was looking at agricultural species, uh, but they were also looking at some species that could be used for ornamentals, as well as species that could be used for land reclamation, reducing soil erosion. Uh, so they were intentionally introducing some species, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then there was also the U.S. Soil Conservation Service in the 1930s. Obviously, if you know anything about the 1930s, uh, there was like the Great Dust Bowl. Uh, farming practices weren't as good at preserving soil as they are now. There was rampant soil erosion everywhere. There was drought out in the Midwest. A lot of soil was being lost. They were trying to find ways to fix that. And one of the ways that they used were these uh, non-native plants. Uh, so one example is kudzu, the plant I just showed you taking over the south. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or I guess the Soil Conservation Service, uh, was actually handing these out to people to plant on their own land and paying them to do so to reduce erosion. And then, of course, that plant became invasive. And now governments have to spend huge amounts of money trying to fight these things. Uh, and then different uh, highway departments uh, were introducing plants to, you know, plant along uh, newly made rights of ways along highways, things like crown vetch, uh, bird's foot trefoil. Those are now very invasive species. Uh, state wildlife departments played their part too. Things like autumn olive, honeysuckle, sericea. They were introducing plants in the name of uh, soil conservation and erosion control, wildlife habitat. Now we know that the, that was a pretty bad idea, uh, but they didn't at the time. Kind of paying the price for it. And of course, a source of invasives that continues today is ornamentals. Uh, there's not a whole lot of restrictions in this country. Uh, so there's some, but they're usually on the state level, and they usually don't get enacted until a, state, a species has been invasive in that state anyway, so it's really more reactive than proactive. Uh, and it is a legitimate source of invasive species, especially for woody ones like shrubs. Uh, there was one study that found like a fourth or no, four-fifths of over 200 species of woody shrubs that are invasive or non-native growing in North America 
they came here because they were being used as ornamentals in landscaping and then then spread into the wild. A uh, good example of this is calorie pear. A lot of people know it by the name Bradford pear. That's just one of the cultivars or varieties. They're actually supposed to be sterile within a cultivar. The problem is they produce so many of these different cultivars uh, that they can interbreed and produce fruit. Uh, and these things were planted because they were these great uh, street trees. People plant them in their yard. They have this nice round shape. They produce all those beautiful white flowers. Uh, they're planted in parking lots and businesses all over the place. Uh, but then with all those different cultivars, they were hybridizing, producing fruit. And now we have these wild pears growing all over the wild. They don't look like their parents. They're conical, and now they're really thorny, too. They look a lot like their wild ancestors that grow in Asia. Uh, and they very quickly take over fields and the edges of highways. Uh, if you've driven through St. Louis in early spring, you've seen all their pretty flowers everywhere, but uh, they're pretty horrible invasive species, and they, they can take over any open area in a matter of years and turn it into an impenetrable thorny thicket. Uh, so why are these invasive species so accessful? Why do they become invasive in these new environments? Kind of talked about their traits that give them a hand, uh, but there are also some factors with the environment that they're being introduced to uh, that is conducive to their success. Um, uh, one of those, I guess, is just being intentionally planted all over the place by people that helps set up a very widespread, abundant population from the get-go. Uh, but maybe more importantly is that there's a lack of species that have any evolutionary history with them that can control them. So all of our native plant species, most of them have a menagerie of different viruses, bacteria, fungi, and insects that are feeding off of them in some way at every life stage, every part of them. Uh, that's going to weaken them. It reduces their growth, their vigor, their seed production. These invasive species, they're coming into a new habitat where Pretty much nothing has any evolutionary history with them, so not many species utilize them. So they kind of have a competitive advantage. See, so like this shrub that's uh, being infected with a fungus, uh, a lot of invasives, they don't have any funguses here that, that attack them. Insects, same thing. Uh, plants that are attacked by insects at all life stages and all their body parts. There's insects that attack their flowers and seeds. They eat the leaves, they burrow into the wood, they attack the stems, the roots. So they're all being limited to insects, but invasive plants often aren't. Uh, and then, of course, we've played a pretty good, uh, we've done a pretty good job as people in kind of removing the native vegetation in general. Uh, so we've cut down forests, we've ripped up the soil for uh, construction projects, housing developments. We're, we're pretty much removing all of the native vegetation that was there and all the topsoil. So that both reduces the competition uh, that invasive species would face, but also creates great habitat for them because they like that disturbance. They like that all that sun. They like they do well with the disturbed soil and the poor nutrients. Uh, so I mean they've done pretty well with the uh, 20 and 20th first century. Uh, think about the Ozarks in Missouri. You now they've been logged clear cut probably two or three times in most places. Uh, you know, prairies have been plowed and sprayed. Uh, there's been rampant overgrazing over the centuries across this country when people just had livestock you know, roaming around. Uh, so we've done quite a number on the native vegetation and that's really helped out a lot of invasive species. And we've created a lot of these early successional habitats that they like. Uh, another thing is changing disturbance regimes regimes. Uh, so for instance, wildfires, say out west, because of all the drought uh, and um, higher temperatures uh, and the uh, active fire suppression that's happened over the centuries. Now they have these huge mega fires, uh, which create perfect habitat for invasives. Like it kills almost all of the plants in the area because it burns so hot. Uh, it leaves it bright and sunny. Uh, removes all of the organic layer from the soil. It creates a great seedbed for invasive species. Uh, there's even some invasive species that increase the fire intensity and the fire frequency, like uh, cheatgrass out west or eucalyptus in California or the Mediterranean. Uh, they do really well with fire and they actually increase the likelihood and severity of any wildfires 
which then increases the amount of available habitat for them to colonize. So it's a positive feedback loop. Uh, in this part of the world, the Midwest, uh, it's probably the opposite. Uh, last few millennia, Native Americans were burning it on a pretty regular basis, but now most of the landscape isn't getting any fire, uh, which has created some opportunities for invasive woody shrubs to then take over large areas of habitat that they wouldn't be able to if it was burning regularly. Uh, there's some imbalances of different animal species, so uh, overgrazing, say on like arid dry rangelands out west, uh, overgrazed areas often tend to have lots of invasive weeds. That's because those cows are eating that uh, often native vegetation or more palatable vegetation uh, very heavily. That reduces it. That gives the invasives or any unpalatable, unpalatable species a competitive advantage. Uh, and many invasive weeds are unpalatable or otherwise poisonous to livestock. Uh, so they can become rampant in those kinds of settings. Uh, but it's also true for native wildlife. So things like uh, elk, uh, there's too many elk in the system. Uh, they can also overgraze as well. Uh, White-tailed deer, this is especially true in parts of the eastern United States, say around New England or Maryland. Uh, they might have white-tailed deer densities that are two, three, four times as high as they probably should be. Uh, and they're overbrowsing often that native vegetation. Uh, and that gives the invasive species that they don't eat a competitive advantage. And on the flip side, uh, we probably also don't have we definitely don't have as many of the large herbivores that we used to. Uh, so, you know, historically, there are also bison and elk throughout Missouri. You don't have that. Uh, most places in the world nowadays, they really don't have the large animal species that they did a couple hundred or thousand years ago, in some cases, even just 50 years ago. So there's not as many large animals out there actively consuming this vegetation. So in some cases, that might have been enough to kind of suppress these invasive species. but. Without any large herbivores, um, there's really not a whole lot to, to you know, eat them. And Sam, we had a really great question on sure. um, whether goats, um, can goats consume some of these invasive, uh, invasive species, um, especially kudzu or any of the other species I know that we're talking about today? Most livestock will eat kudzu. Uh, it's pretty palatable and high in protein. I think it was used to actually feed pigs, too. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert at grazing or goat grazing, but goats and sheep generally have kind of a reputation for eating some plants that, say, cows and horses wouldn't. But I think they can tolerate tannins a little more. Uh, as far as what species, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know that much about goats, but there are some that uh, livestock will eat, and they can be useful, but others that they're, they're just plain poisonous or they're really thorny. Uh, and usually, you know, livestock are going to eat the better stuff first anyway. But, uh, some people do use to use goats uh, to control invasive. You no, know, they've been used to, at least experimentally, to try and control honeysuckle. Yep. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, thousands of years ago, we had just a menagerie of huge animals that were eating vegetation. So, I mean, if we still had mastodons and ground sloths today, maybe huge invasive bush thickets wouldn't be as much of a problem because they'd be ripping them out of the ground and eating them. But we'll never know. Uh, so why should we care about invasives taking all over the place? Uh, so one, uh, a lot of studies have shown that in these invasive plant monocultures, they support a tiny fraction of the insect biomass and diversity that native plant habitats would have. Uh, and obviously, insects are kind of the base of the food chain. A lot of things eat them. So if you're narrowing the base of that food chain as far as the biomass goes, you're narrowing the top. So fewer insects means fewer insectivores, like birds or bats or reptiles, things like that. And then everything else that eats those. Uh, and it's not just insects too, there's also other animals, certain rodents have been shown to be reduced in density or abundance, diversity uh, in these invasive monocultures. So uh, in general, diversity begets, begets diversity. So the more diversity you have in one trophic level, the more diversity and abundance you're gonna have uh, that next level or layer of the food chain. So if you have just a couple invasive species of plants occupying a habitat, that's not gonna support many animals. Uh, kind of an example of this, this might heard of, you might have heard of this uh, study that came out recently 
uh, found that our bird population in North America, uh, we've lost like 3 billion birds. So one in four birds has disappeared since 1970. Uh, part of the reason for that would be habitat destruction, uh, but another important part would be declining in food resources as a result of invasive species taking over different habitats and reducing the amount of uh, both insects and uh, native plant foods like berries. Uh, it also reduces the foraging for large mammals uh, like livestock. Uh, if you have a pasture that's you know full of invasive species, well, every invasive species that's there, that area that is occupying is an area that's not occupied by a palatable species of plant that that livestock can eat and gain weight from. So it reduces the value of that overall pasture. And this is true for wild animals too. Uh, so invasive species out west, they reduce the uh, the quality of the grazing for things like elk or pronghorn, bison in some cases. So it reduces the capacity of those habitats to support uh, lots of herbivorous animals. Uh, I read something recently about uh, lantana, which is a South American invasive plant in Indian tiger reserves. Uh, it's being in very invasive, it's taking over these reserves reduces the amount of deer that those areas can support, which then is going to reduce the amount of tigers that those areas can support. So it's going to support only a, a lower and lower density of tigers. So they do or kind of the effects that invasive plants have, they, they really do reverberate up through the food chain through the entire ecosystem. As far as controlling invasive plants goes, uh, generally it's pretty hard. Uh, it's expensive. It's very labor intensive. Usually it requires herbicide. But obviously, if you're dealing with a really large area, uh, you have limited accessibility. Uh, you, you can't carry 50 gallons of herbicide up a mountain. It's just not going to happen. Uh, it takes a lot of time. You got to treat every single plant. Uh, and then, of course, you're using herbicides. So the potential for contaminating uh, the environment with herbicides, either having toxic effect on the animals or just overspraying and killing some of the native vegetation around it. That happens. Uh, there are a couple different methods of herbicide application. First is foliar spraying. Uh, so what this guy's doing is just spraying a very dilute uh, concentration or solution of herbicide on the plant's leaves. Those leaves will soak up the herbicide. It will go to the roots and kill the plant. Uh, there's also stump treatment which is used for woody species like trees or shrubs. Uh, you're cutting off the stem with something like loppers or hand saws or a chainsaw, uh, and then you're applying a concentrated solution of herbicide to those stumps and that'll soak it in to the roots and kill it. You have to use a more concentrated solution because it's a smaller surface area that you're applying herbicide to. So it needs to be more herbicide per mass of water. So it gets an, a sufficient amount of herbicide to kill it as opposed to spraying all over the leaves. It's a lot of surface area to soak in. So you don't only need like one or 2% herbicide. Uh, Methods called hack and squirts, usually used for trees. You use a hatchet, uh, you make a hatchet mark in the bark, and you apply a high concentration of herbicide. Uh, there's also something called basal barking, which you pretty much just spray concentrated herbicide uh, in an oil solution on the bark. That oil solution allows the herbicide to soak in. You can't do that with every herbicide, though. You can only do it with oil soluble ones. Uh, and then, of course, hand pulling. But if you have a really large infestation, obviously that becomes a little impractical. You see here, all those are all garbage bags full of an invasive species called garlic mustard. Uh, that took a lot of volunteer hours, I'm sure. But you can't do it. Uh, so I'm not going to go over this entire thing. I kind of talked about it a lot in general, but there's a lot of different herbicides you can use for different things. Um, so things like glyphosate, uh, it's the active ingredient in, uh, say, Roundup. That's the most popular brand name. Brand name. Uh, that kills pretty much all plants. You can use that for foliar spray, you can concentrate it and use it for stump treatment. Uh, there's also broadleaf specific herbicides that don't kill grass, but they kill broadleaf plants, like shrubs, trees, and forbs. Uh, a couple different kinds of those. One of the most popular is trichopler, either trichopler ester, which you can mix with oil, or trichopler amine, which you can only mix with water. Uh, there's pickler am, which is usually sold as tordons for stump treatment. Uh, and then there's some grass specific um, herbicides as well. If we have any questions, we can go over that later, but I'm not going to go over every little detail. Uh, so now we're actually going to talk about some of the different invasive species that uh, grow in some of Missouri's bottomlands 
We're not going to go over all of them because it'd be a very, very, very long list. We don't have time. I'm going to hit on the major ones. Uh, so first, in Missouri's invasive plants in general, uh, out of like the 2,800 species of plants that have been documented in Missouri, almost a third of those aren't even from this continent. That's, you know, that's pretty major. Uh, and of those, uh, about 142 species are considered invasive in this state, uh, at least by the Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force. Uh, and those are occurring in pretty much every habitat. Every habitat you can think of has invasive plant species. Uh, you know, stream corridors, river floodplains, that's just one. But, you know, they grow in forests and prairies and glades, everything. Uh, so we're kind of going to break this up by vegetation type. First, I figured we start with shrubs because those are some of the most infamous. Uh, the one that probably everyone knows is honeysuckle. Uh, I guess the more proper name for it is Amur honeysuckle because that's where it comes from. It comes from the Amur drainage, uh, the Amur River drainage in Northeast Asia. The Amur River forms the uh, border between China and Russia. Uh, gets the name Mackii because it was actually first documented by a Russian botanist by the last name of Mack in the mid 1800s. Uh, he was exploring the area because it's very biologically diverse. He brought some samples back to Moscow. They were growing it, uh, cultivating it at the botanical garden there. And from there, it went to different botanical gardens across Europe. And then from Europe, it jumped over the Atlantic into the United States uh, via the US Department of Agriculture looking for suitable ornamental species. Uh, and to, from them, it went to other botanical gardens and nurseries around the country. Uh, the first documented escape in North America was actually in Chicago at the Morton Arboretum in the 1920s. Uh, but despite that, uh, from the 50s to the 80s, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and you know, other people working in the nursery trade uh, were working on different, uh, better cultivars. So they were kind of selectively breeding the plant to be more hardy to American soils and to have more flowers and more berries. So you're kind of creating the perfect invasive monster plant. Uh, and the first uh, documented case of it growing wild in Missouri was in 1983, uh, but very quickly uh, it took over all the major urban areas uh, in Missouri. People were planting it, obviously, for an ornamental. They liked its colorful flowers, uh, they're pretty, uh, but then it very soon took over pretty much every green space in cities like St. Louis, Jeff City, Columbia, Kansas City, Springfield, they're all invested. Every little green space that is not mowed is generally full of honeysuckle. It looks like this. All that green stuff in this in these woods, that's honeysuckle. All right, that was a filter making weird noise. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much everywhere. Uh, so on the left is actually a map of the current distribution. Uh, courtesy of the uh, University of Georgia's Center for Invasive Spe Species and Ecosystem Health. Uh, they make these early detection and distribution maps really useful. Uh, so on the left, all the green counties, those are where they've been reported. Uh, that's where honeysuckle has been reported to occurring. It's not a perfect map because Boone County is not on there, and I know it's here because I see it outside. Uh, so you can kind of fill in the gaps between some of those green dots. Uh, but it's pretty widespread throughout the eastern half of the United States. The map on the right is the projected future distribution of the plant, given its known uh, parameters, environmental parameters that it prefers, and the conditions that exist in the United States. Uh, so you can see it's projected to spread pretty much throughout the eastern half of the country, except some parts of the coastal plain, as well as the west coast. Uh, so it's, it's going to become, become a pretty major plant in this country. It kind of already is. So as far as identifying it, flowers are pretty distinctive. Uh, everyone should know honeysuckle flowers, I'd hope. Uh, they're kind of yellow, they turn white, it's immature. Uh, the shrub itself gets pretty tall. It can, uh, if it's happy, it's 15, 20 feet tall. Uh, the leaves, uh, they're kind of oppositely arranged. Uh, they have smooth margins, and they stay green pretty much from March all the way through December. As far as the bark and the growth form, often it's pretty ugly. They have a lot of stems going all over the place. Uh, they have a distinctive tan color with dark markings. They can get pretty big, about as thick as your arm or leg, especially if they're growing in a sunny area. 
And of course, those berries turn into a abundance. Uh, those flowers turn into abundant abundance of red berries uh, in fall, generally around September. And they are eaten and dispersed mostly by birds, probably also by rodents a little bit. Uh, despite that and their abundance, they're really not that nutritious for birds. They, they lack the fats that many native fruits have. Uh, so they're pretty much just sugar. <laughs> as far as the effect it has on the ecosystem, uh, obviously they, they outcompete every other plant around them. Uh, where you have a honeysuckle infestation, there's virtually no understory vegetation. Uh, you can kind of see that in this picture. There's nothing else growing on that stream bank except honeysuckle. Uh, it's probably not the best at really stabilizing stream banks either, because it has a really rudimentary, shallow root system. It's not good at binding soil like some native species are. Uh, and because it actively outcompetes all other species, it's generally the only thing growing there. Uh, some of this it has on wildlife. There's some studies that shown that uh, it decreases the bird nesting success. So when birds nest there, their nests are more prone to being predated. Uh, waterways that have lots of honeysuckle vegetation tend to have less biological diversity of amphibians. And amphibians that do there often have reduced survival. They alter forest compositions over time. So trees like oaks, they're seedlings, they need lots of sun. So when you, that area gets overtaken with honeysuckle, if they're completely shaded, they can't grow into a mature tree. So the only trees that are going to grow up into mature trees are going to be the most shade tolerant ones like sugar maple. So they actually change the forests or will over time uh, and they reduce the amount of growth or the growth rate of those trees too, just because they're competing so heavily uh, for nutrients and water. Uh, there's been at least one or two studies that have found that uh, areas uh, in headwater streams that have had the honeysuckle around them uh, experimentally removed, those areas then experienced a higher diversity and abundance of aquatic macroinvertebrates. <laughs> exactly why it probably has something to do with the decomposition rates of the leaves and how that uh, interacts with the different trophic levels of insects. <laughs> Here's another picture you can see that's just all honeysuckle. The ground below it is just completely bare. There's no other vegetation. It's just dirt and leaves. Uh, just a good picture of it uh, infesting an area in Colombia along kind of an ephemeral stream. Everything green in this picture is honeysuckle. Same here. Everything is honeysuckle. Here to the bottom of the hill to the very top, all honeysuckle. Uh, so as far as getting rid of it, uh, stump treatment is usually the go-to for most people. So cutting it applying an herbicide in a concentrated form to those uh, uh, stumps. Uh, you can foliar spray it, especially small plants. It's best in kind of fall or late summer, but a lot of other plants have gone dormant. So because honeysuckle keeps its leaves later, uh, that kind of makes it easier to spray without killing all the vegetation that would be growing around it. Uh, some people remove them without herbicide. It's called root docking. You use some sort of hand tool to extract the majority or the base of the root system from the soil. It does work, uh, but if you have a really large infestation over a large area, it gets pretty laborious. Uh, and of course, burning uh, burning an area often reduces the vigor of honeysuckle. It'll top kill it, it'll kill seedlings and uh, seeds, uh, but that's often obviously not practical for most people. Uh, some people actually use forestry mowers to uh, mow entire areas of forests. So they put a forestry mower on a skid loader. And they just mow it all down, and then when it resprouts, they foliar spray it with herbicide. That's, I know what they did at Shaw Nature Reserve, where I worked. Uh, that looks like. So I'm not going to spend as much time with the rest of these. I just figured I'd spend more time with honeysuckle. Uh, so the rest we're going to go much faster. Uh, so the next one we're going to talk about is another shrub called burning bush, sometimes called winged spindle tree. Uh, it's from the same area of the world that honeysuckle is in Asia. Uh, but it's still a very popular ornamental, whereas no one really plants honeysuckle anymore. Uh, and there's a good chance that you might. Uh, all over businesses and uh, residential areas, unfortunately. Uh, parking lot islands, pretty common. Uh, so it's kind of what you'd call it a emergent invasive species in Missouri. Uh, it's not as bad here as it is in other places. It's not as bad yet anyway. Uh, it is actually bad enough that it's been banned in a couple states. Uh, but again, it, it's really more of a reactive uh, legislation. They didn't really do it until it already became invasive, but 
it is what it is. Uh, so it's called a winged spindle tree or winged burning bush because uh, its stems have these really distinctive woody, corky wings or uh, missing a word here. <laughs> yeah, what we produce, we trim it. Uh, yeah, it just has these corky, woody wings, uh, kind of fins growing along all over the stem. Uh, really distinctive. Uh, the seeds are covered in this fleshy red uh, tissue eaten by birds. They disperse it just like honeysuckle. That's what a small shrub would look like. Uh, here's kind of a little thicket of it growing around in uh, Columbia along the MKT Trail. Uh, again, it's not as dominant as honeysuckle, but I imagine if honeysuckle magically disappeared, a uh, burning bush would just kind of step into its place uh, like it has in some some places and be the dominant invasive shrub. Uh, it's a very real possibility. Uh, here's an area probably somewhere in New England. Uh, all those red bushes along the tree line, that all burning bush. Border privet, again, it's native to the same, uh, same area of Asia. It's also kind of a scattered invasive in Missouri. Uh, it's more pervasive in the lake states in New England. There's a lot of different privets that are invasive. Really, you shouldn't trust any of them, in my opinion. Uh, sleeves, they're opposite. Uh, they have smooth margins. They're kind of waxy looking. They have thin gray stems that are kind of spiky. They have thick, not quite thorns, but they're, they're spikes. Uh, gray bark. Uh, they do have pretty attractive, fragrant, sweet flowers. Uh, which then turn into these little purple or blueberries that, again, birds eat and disperse. There's a picture of one with immature fruits. Uh, this one can actually be worse than honeysuckle in some ways. It actually spreads by the root system as opposed to just spreading via seed. So it creates these really dense, thorny thickets just full of these tiny finger diameter stems. And to get rid of it, you'd have to cut and treat every single one of those stems, which is a very painstaking process. Uh, and they vigorously re-sprout. Uh, if you just cut them, they'll just get mad and shoot up like a hydra. Uh, and the stems themselves can also re-root if they're pushed over by water, if they're growing along a creek. Uh, and those stems will then re-root and then send up more stems. Uh, they're, very, they're most aggressive in riparian areas, from what I've seen. That's where they prefer, that's where they grow the thickest. Uh, here's an example of that. Pretty bad. Uh, here's actually a picture of a huge thicket of privet uh, at Shaw Nature Reserve in Grace Summit, Missouri. Uh, it's just taken over the entire stream bank. So autumn olive, this isn't specifically a riparian one, but it will often grow along streams. Uh, it's more of a field or pasture invasive. It's very distinctive. It has bright silvery foliage. You can point it out a mile away. Very widespread in this country. Uh, it's got these very distinctive waxy leaves with bright silvery undersides. Nothing else has that. It's got the red berries, the little white sparkles. Uh, the bark is kind of grayish red and smooth. Uh, again, uh, it's not specifically a riparian species, but it will often grow along stream banks, especially if they're sunny. All right, trees. There's not many trees. Thankfully, there's not a whole lot of invasive trees in this country. Uh, one of the most prolific, though, is called Tree of Heaven. That's uh, from East China. This one is actually invasive on every continent, uh, and it's invasive throughout North America. Uh, it's introduced because it was used as a street tree uh, back in the 1800s. It's very tolerant of air pollution. Obviously, back then, everyone was burning coal. There was horrible air quality. The only trees that would live were these trees. That's where they were grown. They grow anywhere. This one's growing out of a crack in the concrete. Uh, and their leaves and bark, when you kind of crush them up or cut them, it smells like rancid peanut butter. It's really nasty. Uh, they, they do also spread by their roots from these huge clonal stands. They grow really, really, really fast, uh, and they are allelopathic, so they actively suppress the growth of other plants via chemicals. Uh, and these ones have compound leaves, which means that each leaf is made up of multiple leaflets. So the picture on the right, that whole structure is a leaf. A lot of native plants have this configuration, like walnuts and sumacs. Uh, best way to tell them apart is probably just to smell them. If it smells lemony or fruity or good, it's probably a native species. If it smells horrible, like rancid peanut butter, it's probably this one. Uh, 
kind of what its seeds look like. They have those uh, seeds that are dispersed by wind, kind of like ash or maple. Uh, when they're first growing, they kind of look red. Uh, the bark is kind of smooth and gray, like an elephant. And uh, the leaf scars have a pretty distinctive shape. You can see them on the left. That's where the leaf attaches to the stem. Kind of looks like a big, happy, smiley face. Uh, and their stems are first for, for the first few years are pretty pretty unique in that they don't really branch, so they just grow this one huge stick out of the ground, uh, often with a bunch of them because they grow they grow by the roots, they spread by the roots, so it's often a little colony of them. They have really weak wood, uh, and the best way to get rid of them is usually to basil bark them uh, with an herbicide, just treating it on the stem. Uh, apparently, cutting the stem just makes them angry most of the time, uh, or you can follow your spray them. See here, there's a couple infestations. Uh, that's probably one individual plant in each of those pictures, just creating multiple stems. Very vigorous. Uh, second and last one is mimosa, still a very popular ornamental tree. It's very widespread in Asia. It's been here for a couple centuries. People obviously plant it for its bright pink blossoms. Uh, despite being invasive, especially throughout the southeast, it's not restricted in any state. You can still buy it and plant it. But yeah, it's mostly centered in the southeast. Missouri is kind of the northern edge. Uh, it's a big problem kind of around the lower slopes of the Great Smoky Mountains. It has a wide habitat tolerance, but it will it often grows along streams, uh, especially gravel bars. I've seen it growing along gravel bars in the current river. I've also seen it growing along highways in the Ozarks. It, it is definitely an invasive. Uh, the purple blooms are very distinctive. Uh, the foliage is kind of this ferny. A double compound leaf structure, and the bark is smooth and gray, just like Tree of Heaven. And it also creates those huge uh, stands of it, just like Tree of Heaven does. So vines, there's three I'm going to talk about. Uh, one of the worst is Japanese hops, again, also from East Asia. It's closely related to the hop species used for beer, but it is a different species. Uh, it was introduced a couple hundred years ago, uh, mostly for medicinal purposes. So it's used in traditional Asian medicine. Uh, it's now found throughout the eastern United States, but it's very common along major rivers. So this is definitely a, a floodplain plant. Uh, the leaves kind of look like a hybrid between cannabis and maple, and its stems are covered in these really sharp spines uh, that can cut up your hands for pulling them. Uh, their flowers are pretty inconspicuous. And now being a vine, they, they form these dense mats and they climb up trees. Uh, again, they like riparian areas. Uh, major rivers are often heavily infested in their, in their floodplain. Uh, they really like disturbance. They like sunlight. They don't do well in shade, uh, but heavy flooding or forest clearing, maybe fires, uh, they will respond very vigorously. They like that. They like that disturbance. Uh, and they can kill saplings. They're one of the worst trees. Uh, one of the worst invasives that you can have in a, a new tree planting because they will very quickly smother any small sapling you plant and kill it. Uh, but being an annual species, they generally don't get big enough to really affect fully mature trees. <laughs> and they can potentially increase stream bank erosion because being an annual, they have a very, uh, very small weak root system that dies in the fall. And if they're the only thing growing along a stream bank, uh, once those plants die, in the winter, there's really nothing else holding that soil, nothing else holding that stream bank together. Uh, here's a picture along the Katy Trail in Columbia. Higher side of that trail is just nothing but Japanese hops. And that, was, that was for several hundred feet. Uh, this picture in Columbia along the Hinkson Creek grows all the way to the water line almost. And there is a power line clearing along Kirchy Creek in Columbia. So it was cleared out for the power line. It liked all that disturbance. It liked all that sun. It completely took over. Everything growing in there is Japanese hops. All the little dark lumps you see, the little baby trees that tried to grow and got smothered. Uh, so as far as controlling it, uh, generally you need to keep it from producing seed for three years because the seeds will germinate after three years. So if you can keep it, it from seeding at a given site, for that long, you can theoretically get rid of it unless new seed comes in from somewhere else, which it can, often from floods, how it disperses. Uh, mowing works pretty well. Uh, if you're considering like tree plantings, 
Uh, so if you're mowing around those baby trees, that'll keep it under control until those trees get big enough. Uh, hand pulling, it's good for small scales, but you have to wear gloves because it'll tear up your hand with those spiky stems uh, or foliar spraying. Uh, some people will spray pre-emergent chemicals, chemical that actually prevents the seeds from germinating. But unfortunately, it's not selective, so that applies to any plant seed, really. Winter creeper, uh, this one is a perennial woody vine instead of an annual. It's an evergreen, so it's got those waxy, thick leaves. It's also native to East Asia. It was introduced as an ornamental for ground covers. That's now very widespread in America. Uh, so it's got those dark green leaves. It almost looks like a holly leaf. And it climbs up trees uh, with the stems, and it kind of holds together with these little, little rootlets. Look like that. <laughs> You see all along that uh, along that vine creates those little rootlets that stick to the bark like Velcro. And only the climbing uh, stems will actually produce fruit. So to reproduce sexually, uh, they need to climb up a tree with that vine, flower, and produce bright red berries, which birds then eat and disperse. Uh, but they do a pretty good job of um, spreading asex asexually just by the root system to form these huge mats, which just cover up everything. And you see in that picture, I have all that green stuff on the ground, that's winter creeper. There's no native plants there, it's just winter creeper. This is often most severe in urban areas, and it's often thickest, like you get here, uh, in flood areas. It will creep up into the uplands, but it's, it's generally not as dense. And it's very, 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 very shade tolerant. It's one of the most shade tolerant plants there is. So here's an area along MKT Trail in Columbia. It's actually cleared of honeysuckle and they succeeded in making it more open. It's a little more visually appealing, I guess. Uh, but it's really not going to do a whole lot in the way of increasing the plant diversity. Because the entire understory is just a six-inch thick mat of winter creeper. Uh, yeah. There's so many invasive species in the system. You get rid of one, there's still a bunch of others taking over. Uh, there's a stream bank covered in it. Same thing. And you can still buy it. Unfortunately, it's invasive as it is. Uh, I would imagine the chemicals decompose and break down, uh, being organic as they are. Some of it's just in the leaf decomposition, so the leaf, leaves decompose in the soil. It can inhibit some, uh, some native plant growth, but obviously that's kind of reliant on it leafing out every year and dropping its leaves. So if you prevent that, for several years, I imagine that that effect would be much reduced. As far as controlling winter creeper, you can kill the vines climbing up trees pretty easily just by cutting them and treating them with herbicide. Other than that, options are pretty limited. I've heard foliar spraying kind of works sometimes, but because of that really thick waxy cuticle, it's not good at uptaking herbicide very well. So it can take months uh, to actually kill the plant. Uh, I've sprayed it before at Shaw Nature Reserve. I don't know if I actually saw it do much. I don't know if I was there long enough. So maybe spraying it works. I don't know. Hand pulling works too. Have the time. Next one, I'm not going to talk much about Japanese honeysuckle. It's related to bush honeysuckle, but it's a vine, also native to East Asia, just like bush honeysuckle. It was introduced to Europe and then from Europe to North America. And in Europe, it was actually a more vigorous cultivar was uh, Created by a was created by a English botanist, and then was introduced in North America. Uh, someone just said in the chat, "Weed whipping a uh, winter creeper, like a weed whacker, uh, that'll stimulate new growth, which has a much uh, thinner cuticle. That then you can spray that with herbicide, and it'll uptake it better. So that that can work very well in small areas." Uh, Japanese honeysuckle is now invasive pretty much worldwide. Its flowers are pretty much the same as bush honeysuckle. Uh, it's got glossy, at least semi-evergreen leaves that last for the winter. Uh, and its berries are kind of blue or dark purple instead of red. Uh, obviously, it forms huge mats. It often grows up trees and burdens them, pulls them down. And you can also buy it, despite being invasive around the world. It's still legal. Uh, burning helps, but again, that's often not practical or not everyone can do that, obviously. Mowing just seems to make it angry from what I've seen. I can always spot uh, 
a woodland or prairie planting area that's maintained by just mowing instead of fire because it's usually full of Japanese honeysuckle, uh, whereas the fire will top kill it. Well, kill it entirely, but it'll knock it back every time with the regrow. Uh, hand pulling, I've done that pretty laborious, but it does work for small scales. Uh, foliar spraying with either uh, chemical like glyphosate or a broadly specific one. Uh, and you can stump treat the, uh, the woody vines just like with winter creeper. Just a couple more. So grasses and forbs. So one is Johnson grass. Uh, this one was actually introduced as a forage for livestock. Didn't do very well. It was first introduced in like Alabama, maybe. It's native to the Mediterranean region. It's now invasive worldwide too. I often see it growing along roadsides, like in this picture, but it's a monster in bottomland fields, uh, major river floodplains. So if you've ever heard of uh, Big Muddy Net River National Wildlife Refuge along the Missouri River, uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems that people managing those properties have is Johnson grass. Uh, Every time there's a major flood, uh, it just pops up and grows out of control and outcompetes all the wetland vegetation. Uh, so it's also a very extreme agricultural pest. So it's the pest in pastures as well as crop fields that is considered a noxious weed under Missouri's law. Uh, and it does spread by rhizomes, so the root system, see in this picture in the middle, uh, so it forms large clonal stands. Uh, Identifying grasses is pretty difficult, but it kind of helps to compare it to corn. It's fairly closely related to corn, but it's, it's much more slender. But it kind of has that same leaf shape, uh, same kind of yellowish green color. Uh, there's a big patch of it along the Katy Trail. Very, very aggressive plant. There's some in Columbia growing alongside a bunch of Japanese hops. Uh, there's some along the stream bank. Uh, it's actually shadier than I thought it could grow in, but uh, yeah, it does do well with partial shade. It's just taking over that entire area. Uh, so it's pretty hard to kill just because it has such an extensive root system. Uh, herbicide spraying is generally the only way to do it, but it often picks repeated ones from what I've heard. Uh, cows will eat it at certain times of year, but I think when they gorge on it, it will cause some toxicity. I remember correctly, especially during the late in the year. Uh, so the next grass and last grass is called Japanese stilt grass. It's much smaller, grows in forested areas. It's native to South and East Asia. Uh, it was actually first documented in Tennessee in the early 1900s. <clears throat> and I think how it got here is because it was used to stuff crates. It was used as packing in crates coming from Asia. So back then they didn't have styrofoam peanuts, so they used this stuff. Uh, so that's how it actually got here. Uh, it's an annual species, so it only lives one year. Uh, it's pretty short, it's only a couple inches to maybe a few feet tall. It really, really, really likes floodplains and stream banks. It's its favorite habitat. Likes moisture, likes shade. Uh, it goes to seed around September. So if you can't control it by September, uh, you may as well give up for the year because it's already produced a bunch of seed. And getting rid of the adult plants at that point won't matter because they're just going to die in a month anyway. Uh, so they are somewhat distinctive. Uh, they don't look quite like a grass, uh, but they are. The most distinctive thing about them is the central mid vein in the middle of the leaf. It's bright silver color. Uh, there are a couple native species that look a bit like it. There's a native grass called Lyrzia. It has a similar growth form and shape, but it doesn't have that silver stripe. Uh, and then there's some spark weeds like pinkweed uh, that are native forbs. They do look a lot like that, but they have little pink flowers. So if it has colorful flowers, it's obviously not still grass. Uh, its distribution was centered mostly in the Appalachian Mountains, and it's kind of spread outward from there. Unfortunately, it is now in the Ozarks. I've seen it in the uh, National Scenic Riverway in the current river, unfortunately. I've seen it in multiple parts of the uh, Merrimack River drainage. And it's invasive on every continent. Globalization. Uh, so it's allelopathic in that it actually inhibits the germination of native seeds. Uh, like I said before, it really likes shade, likes disturbance. Uh, it's thought that in some parts of the country it's actually increased because of overbrowsing by deer on native vegetation, places like Maryland. Uh, they have a really high deer density. 
uh, gave it a competitive advantage because all the native plants are getting eaten. That just kind of clears the way for these guys. Uh, there's some sad pictures of it spreading through a uh, Appalachian Valley, just like a green smoke covering the land. I haven't seen infestations quite that bad, but I've seen some pretty bad ones. Uh, because it's an annual, it has a shallow root system, it's easy to pull. You can spray it with a low concentration of uh, herbicide, uh, but they rapidly disperse downstream, so water is mainly how their seeds are dispersing. Last one, a garlic mustard. It's a forb, a wildflower. This one's actually native to Europe, as opposed to all the other ones, which are mostly Asian. Uh, it's introduced very early on as uh, kind of an edible herb. It's from the mustard family, but it smells kind of like garlic. Uh, and it's a biennial, so it lives two years. It is pretty widespread in Missouri, but it's mostly it's worse along the Great Lakes region in New England. Just like the Japanese stilt grass, it's very shade tolerant, uh, but it needs lots of moisture. So it's, it does great in stream banks. Uh, it is also allelopathic, it inhibits other plants. Uh, it also seems to have a negative effect on mycorrhizal fungi in the soil which often have mutual relationships with native plants. So it has a negative impact on those as well. And obviously it shades out native plants. It's what they do. So they're biennial, they live for two years. They have two different growth forms. So the first year, uh, they have just these big basil leaves. They're round, they're kind of scalloped, kind of heart-shaped or kidney-shaped. Their second year of life, they bolt uh, to make stems and flowers so they can reproduce. Those leaves are usually a little more triangular and heavily toothed. And the flowers are pretty distinctive. Being a mustard, uh, they have only four petals. Uh, and in this case, they're white. Uh, and then those eventually turn into these long, kind of beanie looking seed pods, uh, which will dry out and turn brown, crack open, uh, and disperse the seeds. Uh, here's a field just full of garlic mustard. Those little white flowers, same thing here. This one is a monster in river bottoms. Uh, this is probably an infestation of first year plants, all those little tiny scalloped leaves. Uh, there are a couple other species that look like that uh, that are not native, but they're not quite as invasive as this one. There's the uh, seed pods, they're not quite ripe. As far as getting rid of this one, uh, hand pulling is a pretty good method, uh, just because even in large infestations, uh, there's not as many individual plants because it's a larger plant, it's a couple feet tall. So that can be a practical way to, to get rid of this one, uh, especially for second year plants that have that stem, it's easy to pull. Uh, the first year plants, usually herbicide treatment is the best way to go. Uh, you can spray the second year plants, but you have to do it before those flowers are fertilized and mature because you want the plant to die before it creates its seed. All right, so those are, all the species that I wanted to talk about. So the last part of this presentation, I'm gonna go as fast as I can, kind of looking into the future uh, for invasive plants in this country in Missouri. Uh, what does the future hold? What does it look like? And what can we do about it? So this graph just kind of shows that over time, uh, infestations obviously get worse and the worse they are, the more expensive they are, uh, but also, people generally don't really take notice until things are a little too late. So the first usually invasive species are usually detected on the landscape a bit after they're introduced. So a lot of people are really bad at botany, even in this field, uh, walking through a forest, they might not notice something that shouldn't be there. Uh, but once they do, it's usually a matter of several years before anyone really sees it as a problem and takes it seriously as something that needs to be stopped. Uh, so by that time, it's, it's spread has gotten even worse, and the likelihood of actually getting rid of it keeps going down. Unfortunately, for most of our invasive species now, uh, they've been here for so long, uh, they're kind of at the point where you can really only get rid of them in really small areas. And generally, you have to maintain an effort to keep them out of there. Um, so all things like honeysuckle and that, it didn't really start getting a whole lot of attention until it was really too late. Uh, are already infested every every urban area. Uh, so Missouri's noxious weed law list, just a list of species that are banned for sale in Missouri and are you know, theoretically illegal to have on your property, but that's not really enforceable by uh, 
the Department of Agriculture. It's really up to counties to prosecute that if they want to, but obviously they don't. Uh, there's only 12 species and only like one of them was on the list we just did. Uh, it's not a very complete list. Other states have hundreds of species in their noxious weed law list, but it really doesn't matter because you can put things on lists until the cows come home. But if that's all you really do, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, so unfortunately, invasive species, all the invasive species we have are just going to keep spreading. So our invasive species are going to become other states' invasive species. Their invasive species are going to become our invasive species. Uh, there was one study that found that the average invasive plant is only occupying about 50% of the range uh, that it will or can. So over time, these things are going to keep spreading like living things do and occupying all of the habitats they physically can. Some examples of this is on the left, a plant called heavenly bamboo. It's got berries that are actually poisonous to birds if they eat too much of them. It's mostly a southern plant, as you can see the purple on that map. Uh, the orange is where it could grow. Uh, so you can see, according to this map, all most of Missouri is up for grabs. Uh, and just a couple of years ago, there was the first documented case of it in southwestern Missouri. Um, Nile Aminit vine, similar things. Asian vine, uh, pretty bad in northeast part of the country. It's where it is. Uh, but it, it seems to be that it could potentially spread as far west as Missouri unfortunately. So these things are going to keep spreading. And then, of course, new invasives are going to make themselves known as we keep introducing different plants, either intentionally or accidentally. And like I said, there's usually a lag time between when a species in first, is first introduced and the time when it actually starts becoming invasive. So that can give people kind of a false sense of security. Uh, and another study found that the potential exists for like a thousand new invasive species, given all the uh, species out there in the world that display some invasive species characteristics that haven't yet been introduced, but could be. So that's all very depressing. Uh, so I will end with some good news. I felt that's important. Everyone likes good news. Uh, one piece of good news is that Ecosystems, living things in general, they adapt, they're dynamic, they change over time. Uh, they're good with dealing with new things. Uh, the pests of plants, you know, insects, the fungi, the viruses, the bacteria, they're all things that reproduce very, very quickly. They have a lot of generations in a short amount of time. That means that they can evolve very quickly too. It's rapid evolution. So think about uh, like the bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics very quickly. It's the same principle. So over time, these things are eventually going to start better utilizing and feeding off of or parasitizing these invasive plant species, like all the other native plants are dealing with. <clears throat> and there's a selective advantage for that because invasive plant species are everywhere. So if you're an insect that has uh, a mutation, either behaviorally or physiologically, that allows you to eat honeysuckle and seek it out, they'll do very well because there's lots of it. So that's going to be selected for it. Uh, there are some caveats to that, though. Uh, one, it, it's going to take a lot of time before these invasive species will become fully incorporated into any new ecosystem, talking centuries, if not thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. It'll take a long time. The other caveat is that as these new ecosystems are kind of working themselves out, uh, a lot of native species are going to be lost. There's just not going to be room for them. The habitat's going to change in such a way that's just not suitable for them, and they're going to kind of be left out of whatever that new system is. But eventually new species will evolve through speciation. Uh, some examples of uh, existing species kind of evolving or adapting to take use of these invasive plants. Uh, one of them is the Atlantis webworm, so that little uh, moth you see in the corner. Uh, it's actually native to originally southern United States, Central America, and it was feeding on relatives of the Tree of Heaven, so plants in the same family that were native to those areas. Uh, but since Tree of Heaven was introduced a couple centuries ago, this moth has been actually spreading northward as far north as Canada, using the Tree of Heaven as a host plant because it's uh, the leaf chemistry is similar enough to the native host species that it can then use them. It doesn't really control it, uh, doesn't do enough damage to control the tree, but it does feed off of them. Uh, another example, also for Tree of Heaven, is a, a native fungus. This honeysuckle wilt. 
Uh, so one question was about honeysuckle wilt as a fungus disease, I think, uh, has been known to kill honeysuckle, I think, in Ohio. Uh, and there's also some aphids that have been known to feed on it. Uh, I don't know if the, those two are related. Uh, has it been starting to knock back honeysuckle in Missouri? Uh, not from what I've seen, no. All the honeysuckle I've seen here has been healthy enough. But over time, I imagine more and more of those kinds of things will, will crop up and eventually limit honey, honeysuckle in some way. Uh, this fungus I was talking about, uh, it's, an, it's an American fungus. It utilizes multiple plant species. Uh, but in the last I think, couple of years or decades, they found that it's starting to use Tree of Heaven too. Uh, and it causes this tree wilt in Tree of Heaven. Uh, you see the picture on the top, all those dead trees, those are all Tree of Heaven that died from this fungus. All right. And there is some, some avenue, some means of controlling invasives on a landscape scale. So manual removal invasive or manual removal and herbicide treatments, those, those are small scale treatments. You can't do that over an entire state or country. It's just not practical. Uh, but biocontrols is potentially a way to do that. So most people think of biocontrols, they think of things like using ladybugs to eat aphids. Uh, and often that is the case. So using different insects to control other insects, usually agricultural pests. Uh, but sometimes they are actually used to control invasive plants. Uh, so often it's using herbivorous insects, things like weevils, which are a kind of beetle. They often specialize in certain plants and feed on different parts of them throughout their life cycle. Sometimes different funguses are used for bacteria, but often it's insects. How this works is you find either an insect or a pathogen from the native range of the invasive plant, something that has an evolutionary history with it, something that uses it specifically. Uh, you test that, see if it works. And then you kind of bring it over and introduce it and let it do its thing. And often they'll use multiple uh, different control species uh, to target any one specific plant, uh, just to kind of deliver a one-two punch uh, and attack as many different parts of the plant as possible. Uh, so like I said, weevils are a pretty common biocontrol species. Uh, here there's some weevils uh, feeding on the seeds of a thistle. So there's a lot of invasive European thistles in this country. I think in the 80s or 90s, they introduced a bunch of weevils, might have been even before that, uh, that feed specifically on thistles, and that has dramatically reduced the abundance uh, of thistle in this country. It's still out there, but it's not as abundant as it used to be, uh, in part because all those little weevil larvae are feasting on all of its seeds, and that reduces the amount of seed that it'll produce in any given year. There's some sort of spider mite that feeds on this thorny invasive shrub called gorse, it's a pest in Hawaii. Uh, like I said, you, you generally want a multitude of different uh, control species to attack different parts. Uh, so they might be eating the foliage, they might be boring into the stem or the wood, they might be eating the roots, they might be attacking the flowers and the seeds, uh, as many things as possible. There are some pretty good examples of uh, biocontrols that were used very successfully uh, in the past. Uh, one of those was in Australia. Uh, so during the early 1900s in Australia, uh, prickly pear cactus, Apuntia, uh, was infesting hundreds of square miles of Australia. It was turning rangeland and farmland, wild areas, uh, completely inhabitable, unfarmable, just endless swathes of pokey prickly cactus like you can see in that picture on the left. Uh, but someone came up with the bright idea of introducing a moth from South America whose larvae feed exclusively upon the Sapuntia cactus. So they imported some of these moths uh, They became successfully established. Uh, and uh, they did very, very well in this habitat full of their food. Uh, and their larvae burrowed into the uh, cactus pads and uh, destroyed them, ate on them, uh, and now prickly pear in Australia, while you can still find it, uh, is much reduced and is much rarer species in these huge monocultures no longer occur in that continent. Uh, some other examples would be Klamath weed, uh, kind of around the northwest in the USA, especially around northern California. Uh, so Klamath weed, which is that plant in the picture on the right, uh, it's a European St. John's wort. That was an invasive species. It's poisonous. It was taking over 
uh, rangeland out west. Uh, pretty bad, pretty bad pest. Uh, so what they did is they introduced some species of beetle from Europe that specialized in feeding on this weed, uh, and now it's rather rare. Again, also in the United States was uh, purple loosestrife. That's uh, kind of an aquatic, uh, semi-aquatic invasive species that invades wetlands. As you can see that picture in the center, it can get a complete monoculture in wetlands, reduce all the native plant diversity. Uh, again, around the 90s, 80s, 90s, I did some biocontrol research, and then they uh, successfully introduced and established a couple species of beetles to feed exclusively on this European plant. Uh, and now, uh, in some places, they've seen over 90, 95% reduction uh, in the um, in this purple loosestrife around New England and the Lake States further north. So, how the biocontrol research works in this country, it's, it's done by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, namely the uh, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, I think. Uh, so, what they do is generally they're looking for uh, some sort of pest species that has some evolutionary history with the invasive plant. So they're going to go into that native range of the plant, look for a species there. Uh, they're going to rear that species in captivity, uh, and they're going to test it to see how much host specificity it is. That is, uh, does it only eat this plant, <clears throat> or will it eat lots of other plants? And if it eats lots of other plants, then they're not going to want to introduce it to the United States then it could potentially damage our native plant species. Uh, but if it looks like it's, it's pretty host specific, uh, they'll kind of rear it in quarantine. Uh, if it passes uh, kind of inspection in a different country, then they'll import it, they'll grow it in quarantine in the United States, in a lab setting indoors, uh, they'll feed it native American plants to see if it'll feed on any of those or if it'll just eat the invasive. Uh, and then they'll kind of rear it in an outdoor controlled setting, uh, still in kind of in captivity, uh, to see if it can survive outside on its own uh, and to see if it can actually effectively control that invasive species. So that's how that works. Uh, and then after all that research, it's submitted and it either gets approved or denied by a, a board of kind of independent experts and researchers that might give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or say, uh, you need to do a little more research on this before we kind of make up our minds. Uh, so there are some, a lot of pros to doing uh, biocontrols in terms of invasive species management. Uh, one, you can consider it a holistic approach. So you're thinking about the entire system as a whole. <laughs> Uh, while the research itself can be pretty expensive, uh, it's very cheap to apply. You're pretty much just walking out there and releasing a bunch of bugs like these guys are doing. Easy peasy. Uh, you're also not limited by terrain or any property boundaries, so those bugs are going to theoretically spread over the entire landscape. Uh, whereas if you're doing like herbicide control, you can really only do that on your own property. So if it's public land, you do it there, but you can't do it past the uh, border onto private land, even if there are a bunch of invasive species there, uh, delivering seed constantly into that public conservation area. Uh, but with those biocontrols, they can spread everywhere. They don't care about political boundaries or anything like that. Uh, ideally, they're also permanent, so they're kind of a permanent fixture in the environment. They're going to be there as long as that invasive plant is there, uh, kind of controlling it, suppressing its spread and abundance. Uh, obviously, the host specificity. So if you do do it right, they're only going to attack that one invasive plant you want. Uh, whereas, say, like herbicide treatment, you can't be careful about it, but there is usually some overspray. You're going to have some uh, accidental killing of desirable plants around whatever you're spraying. Uh, and there's also the potential to form new energy pathways uh, between those invasive plants and other organisms higher in the food chain uh, because you're now providing more of a link in terms of those herbivorous insects and other things that would eat them, like other insects or bats or birds, other animals higher in the food chain. So that way the energy that those invasive plants are harnessing into their tissues can then pass through the rest of the food chain, just like any native plant would. So they become more incorporated potentially. 
Uh, there are, so, are some cons to using biocontrol research. Uh, so one is just it's a really lengthy approval process. Uh, it's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of research. Uh, there are a few cases in which it's taken decades. Uh, so I know the uh, biocontrol research into controlling garlic mustard, which is the little biennial forb I talked about earlier. Uh, that started in the 90s, and I think it only just got approved. They only just approved like one species of beetle out of the four or five weevils uh, that they were researching. So it took a very, very long time. Uh, it can also take time for these species to establish in the wild, and it takes multiple introduction attempts to get enough individuals out there in the wild. Uh, and just, you know, insects aren't always the great, aren't always the best at uh, migrating and spreading. So it can take several years for them to really build up populations and start spreading throughout that landscape. Uh, there's also the possibility it might not completely control whatever invasive plant is out there that you're trying to control. Uh, even if you introduce a bunch of insects successfully and they're feeding on it, uh, they might not do it to the extent where it really limits the plant in any significant way. So even though it's being damaged, it's still producing tons and tons of seed and it's still being a noxious weed. Uh, Uh, so then there's, of course, the uh, risk of introducing new invasive species. Uh, this isn't as much of a problem as it used to be because of all the rigorous research, but uh, there are some past cases uh, which kind of serve as warnings. Uh, one of the most infamous of those is the uh, cane toads in Australia. So the Australians did it pretty well with the controlling the cactus with the uh, South American moths. Uh, but then they really dropped the ball with these toads. So the, the cane toads were introduced to try and control the uh, sugarcane beetles that were attacking sugarcane crops. Uh, but if the person or people who decided this knew anything about either species, they would have known that that was a terrible idea because the sugarcane beetles are feeding, you know, six or feet more off the ground in the sugarcane, and the cane toads can't jump more than maybe a couple inches off the ground. They're feeding entirely on the ground. So there was no chance that the toads were ever going to feed on the insects ever. Uh, and not just that, but they actually became a horrible pest themselves because they're poisonous and a lot of Australia's native animals will eat them uh, because there are no toads to in Australia. So they don't know that toads are poisonous. So all the snakes and lizards and uh, mammals and pets that will try and eat these toads, they'll be poisoned and die. Uh, so that's a pretty extreme example of biocontrols gone wrong. Uh, there is another case, so some of the weevils that were introduced to control the invasive thistles, they aren't uh, as, they don't target the European thistles as specifically as we would like. They do attack some of the native thistles uh, to some degree, uh, but that was some earlier biocontrol research and it's a little more rigorous now. But yeah, there is there are risks. Uh, another downside is that uh, the species, the invasive plant species that get kind of prioritized for biocontrol research are usually the ones that uh, are having the most economic impact. <laughs> so even if it's deteriorating wildlife habitat and biodiversity, uh, if it's not costing anyone a lot of money, uh, it's probably kind of low on the priorities. So if it's not affecting crops or timber harvest or outdoor recreation, uh, it's going to be a pretty low priority. Uh, on the other side of that, uh, if it's an invasive species that's closely related to an important crop species, uh, researchers might be pretty hesitant to even explore the possibility of using a biocontrol. So take Japanese hops. Uh, it's a horrible invasive species, but it's very closely related to the hop species used for beer production. So people probably aren't going to want to uh, be looking to introduce any species that would feed on Japanese hops because there's a pretty high likelihood that they could then also feed on the hops used for beer. Uh, same thing with um, what is it? Johnson grass, because it's related to sorghums, which are uh, important crop. Uh, yeah, it's just one downside. Uh, so some other solutions, landscape st scale solutions, holistic solutions for invasive species. Uh, one is just kind of good land management. So one protecting large impact natural areas or as much as natural as they are. Uh, that really helps fight invasive species. 
uh, invasive species tend not to colonize large undisturbed habitats as readily as really small fragmented disturbed ones. Uh, so keeping those natural areas intact uh, and protecting them, uh, that's a good step towards at least preventing things from getting worse. Uh, and then actively restoring uh, either natural areas or uh, other disturbed areas, uh, whether they be public or private land, reducing the amount of acreage that is covered with invasive species, and then converting that into natural native vegetation and ecosystems. Uh, so those systems and habitats and ecological services can still continue and actually be increased again on the landscape. Uh, here's a good example of that, just a, a stream corridor at Shaw Nature Reserve, those brush creeks covered with invasive species, mostly privet, honeysuckle. And then through a lot of volunteer work, it was actively restored. They reduced all of the uh, invasive shrubby cover and managed to uh, seed the area with a lot of native species. And that's what it looks like now. So while that's not a completely landscape scale solution, you can't do that over the entire world. Uh, it does help to do here and there, especially uh, some of the best areas or around the most natural areas to try and keep those as impact as possible. Uh, keeping natural disturbance regimes, regimes uh, it's also a pretty good way to try and limit invasives. So uh, the kind of disturbances that native habitats have evolved with, things like fire, floods, grazing, uh, keeping those on the landscape uh, in the right places, in the right ways, right times, uh, that helps the native species that have evolved with those things, uh, that keeps those systems more resilient, which prevents invasive species from really taking hold and exploding in numbers. Uh, and then just education. So uh, I guess what I'm doing now is to, uh, kind of getting the word out about invasive species, what, spe what species are invasive, what species are native, uh, what people can do about them, uh, things like that. Uh, can affect people's uh, buying choices when they're looking to buy different plants for landscaping purposes. Uh, and then, of course, different legal restrictions, uh, restricting what kinds of plants uh, the country can either import or what plants can be sold. Uh, there have been a couple invasive species that are banned at the state level, so they're not allowed to be sold. Uh, the uh, Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force is kind of working on an initiative uh, to eventually make some sort of uh, law that bans certain invasive species, the sale of certain invasive species in this state. Uh, right now, I think they're working with uh, different stakeholders trying to identify uh, what species they'll have on that list. So hopefully more comes from that in the future. So what can you do? Uh, one is research, just learn as much as possible. Obviously, I can't teach you everything in an hour. Uh, so the Missouri Invasive Plant Task Force uh, is a really good source. It's very Missouri oriented. It's a list of all the uh, different species that are considered invasive in Missouri. Uh, you can look at range maps. You can look at different scientific papers on research into invasives, uh, different initiatives, volunteer opportunities. It's a really good place to look. Uh, and then, of course, the um, uh, invasives.org, which is where I got all those really cool maps of invasive species. It's another good resource for learning identification. A lot of pictures, uh, a lot of maps, a lot of good information there. Uh, so, where are some other things you can do? Well, one, you can remove invasive species on your property if you have any. Uh, you know, it might seem limited in scale, but you know, if it's one of those things that everyone did, it would make an impact, and it is something you can do. <laughs> Uh, especially if you're repl then replacing those invasive species with more native species, to try and increase their presence on the landscape. Because uh, for many of them, they, they're really just uh, I mean, they're not as common as they used to be. They're they're pretty they're pretty lacking on the landscape nowadays, especially in urban areas. Uh, so incorporating those native species, at least on your own property, uh, can help prop up both those species and the animals that depend on them. Another good way is to get involved in volunteering. Uh, there's a lot of volunteering projects in terms of invasive species control around the state and the country, uh, either with city parks or state parks, uh, MDC, Master Naturalist. 
Here's a group of volunteers that we worked with at Shaw Nature Reserve, my past job. A great bunch of people. They all learned a lot. They really liked doing it. They did a lot of invasive species control, a lot of clearing honeysuckle, uh, as well as things like seed collection. So, yeah, volunteering is always a good way to go. That's all I got. So uh, thank you for watching. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, definitely a very informative presentation. Um, and for anyone who may have had unanswered questions, um, please feel free to contact us at streamteam at mdc.mo.gov. Um, and please stay tuned for additional stream sessions that will be scheduled for uh, spring of 2021. So we thank you again. Everybody have a great day.